In 1966, Warner Brothers took a leap in Hollywood filmmaking by releasing their screen adaptation of Edward Albee's 1962 play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? The film, led by two of the biggest stars in the world, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, used a wide array of language never before heard on the screen, previously held back by the Hays Code, the industry's guide to themes and practices considered objectionable for film. Upon hearing that a film adaptation of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was in the works, the Motion Picture Association of America warned that if the original language of the play was left intact, they could forget about being granted a seal of approval. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf became a smash hit, raking in $14.5 million and becoming the third highest grossing movie of 1966. In the introduction of his review for The Hollywood Reporter, James Powers was especially emphatic. Quote, The screen has never held a more shattering and indelible drama than Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It will be nominated for every category it fits in next year's Academy Awards, and it deserves to win them all. It will tote up an equally impressive score at the box office. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is an instant film classic, and Warner Brothers deserves the highest credit for making it a movie without compromise. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was far from the first film to push the limits of the production code, but it was arguably the one that sent the code crashing down. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was nominated for 13 Academy Awards and won 5, losing Best Picture to the more traditional A Man for All Seasons. However, where Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf reads like an anomaly amongst the other highest grossing films of 1966, it reads like a landmark when compared to the years after as films like The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, the films of BBS Productions, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Putney Swope, and Rosemary's Baby signaled a new movement emerging. This movement coincided with the rising counterculture, expressing distaste with racial segregation, the war in Vietnam, and various other social issues. In 1968, the MPAA did away with the production code entirely in favor of a new rating system, classifying how appropriate a movie was for an audience based on its content. This, in essence, allowed filmmakers and studios to explore a wide range of new themes, topics, and issues including sex, drugs, graphic violence, race relations, explicitly queer content, miscegenation, and much more. In 1969, Midnight Cowboy, a drama that explored the relationship between a hustler from Texas and a con man, became the first X-rated film to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Old Hollywood was dead, and new Hollywood reigned supreme. Meanwhile, throughout the 1960s, the movie musical had a lot of ups and downs. The triple whammy successes of Mary Poppins, My Fair Lady, and especially The Sound of Music indicated to studios that lavish, big-budget musicals seemed to be a safe bet, not accounting for the very unique cultural precedences all three films had. In return, studios lost a lot of money on a wide array of box office disappointments and downright flops, like Camelot, Dr. Doolittle, Sweet Charity, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Star, and finally, Hello Dolly, which single-handedly almost put 20th Century Fox out of business. In 1972, the film adaptation of Cabaret signaled an ability for the movie musical to adapt to the changing cinematic landscape. From there, movie musicals are a bit few and far between, and the ones that were financially successful usually tapped into a zeitgeist that craved and embraced realism and or taboo in some way. One part of the history of the American movie musical that tends to get overlooked when discussing this transition from old Hollywood to new Hollywood, though, is the undeniable success of Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof, an adaptation of the hit 1964 Broadway musical, was released in movie theaters on November 3, 1971, and it gradually became the highest grossing film of the year. On its surface, Fiddler is pretty typical of other big-budget roadshow releases of the 50s and 60s. It's based on a popular Broadway musical, it boasts an immense three-hour runtime, its screenplay remains undeniably faithful to the source material, and though its budget didn't reach the heights of some of the movie musicals that came before it, its $9 million price tag was nothing to scoff at. Domestically, the film grossed about $40 million, equivalent to about $292 million today, beating out some of 1971's most notable hits, Dirty Harry, The Last Picture Show, A Clockwork Orange, and the eventual Best Picture winner, The French Connection. Given the tumultuous performance of musicals throughout the 60s, the rare and raw nature of successful musicals in the 70s, and how rapidly changing the theatrical landscape was becoming, it's a bit shocking to look back and see just how successful Fiddler on the Roof was at the time of its release. How did a big-budget Hollywood musical about a community of traditional Jewish villagers in 1900s Russia, released in the midst of Hollywood's biggest creative reckoning, become a long-standing musical classic? And how did it, or did it not, reckon with New Hollywood as a movement? 
Fiddler on the Roof starts with lyricist Sheldon Harnick. He was gifted a copy of Sholem Aleichem's novel Wandering Stars, which he passed on to musician Jerry Bach. They both saw the potential for a musical, so they passed the novel on to writer Joseph Stein, hoping he'd be able to write the book for their musical. Stein couldn't envision a musical version of Wandering Stars, so he suggested Aleichem's stories of Tevye and his daughters, which he'd read in his youth. The musical story, based in a shtetl called Anatevka in turn of the century Russia, follows Tevye, a poor dairy farmer who lives with his wife Golda and their five daughters, three of whom are coming of age. Though Tevye is poor, he's comfortable with the traditions of his religion and his village, and he longs to keep living as traditionally as possible. When Yenta, the town matchmaker, tries to set up their oldest daughter Zaitel with the wealthy butcher Laserwolf, Zaitel refuses, longing to marry Motel, a poor tailor who she's fallen in love with. Zaitel's sisters, Hadel and Hava, also long to choose their own husbands. Meanwhile, government interference by the Tsar and his officers threatens to upend the traditional way of life for the Jewish villagers. At the end of the play, the villagers are forced out of Anatevka with three days' notice, and they must find a new place to live. Fiddler on the Roof's Broadway run was a huge success. The show boasted some of the longest lines of any Broadway show in existence, to the point that producer Hal Prince would bring out coffee for those waiting for tickets. The original Broadway production ran for 3,242 performances, becoming, at the time, the longest running show in Broadway's history. Since then, the show has received five Broadway revivals and a wide array of stateside and international productions, including a 2018 off-Broadway revival performed entirely in Yiddish. According to the documentary Fiddler, A Miracle of Miracles, the show had been performed somewhere in the world every single day since it opened on Broadway up to the documentary's release in fall 2019. As soon as the lines outside of the Imperial Theatre began to form, though, a film adaptation was imminent. United Artists and the Mirish Company, who'd produced the wildly successful film adaptation of West Side Story in 1961, took on Fiddler on the Roof. In the years leading up to Fiddler, the Mirish Company had utilized director Norman Jewison on three films that had become huge successes, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, The Thomas Crown Affair, and In the Heat of the Night, which won the Oscar for Best Picture in 1967. Given his work with socially conscious themes and material, as well as his television work directing variety specials for Harry Belafonte and Judy Garland, on top of that last name of his, Jewison seemed like the ultimate pick for Fiddler. When presented with the offer, he was stunned. He turned to Arthur Krim, president of United Artists, and said, There's one enormous problem of me directing the film. What would you say if I told you I was a goy? Despite this, Jewison put in a wealth of time and effort to learn the traditions and practices of the Jewish religion, especially at the turn of the century, leading Chaim Topol to remark, He's going to convert into Judaism and call him and change his name to Norman Christians. Jewison was extremely dedicated to Fiddler, seeing it as, in his words, the most important film that would be released in 1971. Jewison from the jump strove to depict the world of Fiddler on the Roof with a sense of realism to the Jewish culture, while maintaining some of the joyous yet bittersweet tone that kept people returning to the stage musical. He sought, though, to heighten the tension of the story's opposition by more clearly showing the explicit anti-Semitic violence that was merely hinted at in the stage version. Furthermore, while he admired movie musicals of the 30s and 40s, he also recognized that in the space of the late 60s and 70s, quote, they were fantasies, and we don't make fantasy films in the very realistic world of today's cinema." Unquote. This led him to figure out emotional and aesthetic ways to ground Fiddler in the sense of realism, leading into Jewish traditions and establishments, like the visual motif of Anatevka's synagogue. Jewison plunged into the writings of Heschel, Morris Samuel, Sholem Aleichem, and many others as well as various art books depicting Eastern European life. He also took a five-day trip to Israel and interviewed families in religious neighborhoods. Jewison faced a lot of pressure to cast Zero Mostel as Tevye. Mostel, an incredibly popular comedic actor, had originated the role on Broadway, and although transferring the role to the screen wasn't the most common practice, his presence in Fiddler arguably helped to cement much of its early success. Jewison also reportedly received calls from Danny Kaye and Frank Sinatra's teams about how they wanted to play Tevye, which he flatly refused. Jewison and his team eventually landed on Chaim Topol, an Israeli Jewish man who played Tevye in the original West End production of Fiddler, believing that people would see him as embodying Tevye more than they would Zero Mostel, who Jewison believed audiences would just see as Zero Mostel. Jewison and his team opted to film Fiddler in Eastern Europe, primarily Yugoslavia, 
Opposed to many movie musicals up to this point, much of Fiddler on the Roof was filmed in actual locations rather than sound stages, though production did utilize Pinewood Studios in England, primarily for the Tevye's dream sequence as well as the wedding at the end of Act 1. The cast was rounded out with various working stage and screen actors. Norma Crane, a member of the actor studio who'd appeared on stage in The Crucible and on screen in Teen Sympathy as Golda. Rosalind Harris, Bette Midler's understudy for Zytel on Broadway as the film Zytel. And Leonard Fry, who'd received acclaim for his work in the original off-Broadway production and film adaptation of The Boys in the Band as Mottel, were among the film's ensemble. Production took roughly six to nine months, spanning late 1970 to early 1971. The film opened on November 3, 1971 in a roadshow-style presentation akin to many big-budget spectacles released in the decade before. Reviews at the time were mixed to positive. Roger Ebert admitted in his review for the Chicago Sun-Times that he found the source material quite boring, but praised director Norman Jewison and Molly Pekin, the actress who played Yint to the matchmaker. Ebert also felt that, in the process of Fiddler's cultural domination, it had become too polished and removed from Shola Malakum's original works. Vincent Canby of the New York Times felt that the adaptation was, quote, typical of what's wrong not only with this film, but with almost every other movie adaptation of a Broadway show that has become so successful that it's become an industry within an industry. Norman Jewison and Joseph Stein have sought only to enlarge the physical frame of the show by setting it in its time, 1905, and physical place, in a real village with real houses, in real barns with real animals, in real fields and real landscapes. Camby would go on to praise Leonard Fry, Molly Pekin, and Topol, though he felt Topol was miscast. On the other side of the coin, Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune loved the film, praising its scope and moving from stage to screen, and saying the musical numbers were, quote, better staged and choreographed than in any recent Broadway film adaptation, unquote. The notoriously hard-to-please Pauline Kael also loved Fiddler on the Roof, writing in The New Yorker that it was, quote, an absolutely smashing movie. It is not especially sensitive, it is far from delicate, and it isn't even particularly imaginative, but it seems to be the most powerful movie musical ever made." Unquote. A series of backhanded compliments, for sure, but for Kale, high praise nevertheless. Fiddler on the Roof was the highest grossing film of 1971. The film ran exclusively in its roadshow presentation from November 1971 seemingly until about a week before the 44th Academy Awards in April 1972, where it was nominated for eight awards including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor for Topol, and Best Supporting Actor for Leonard Fry. It lost those awards, but it did win three others, Best Cinematography, Best Sound, and Best Score Adaptation, marking the first of five career Oscar wins for John Williams. Despite being the highest grossing film of the year, it never actually reached the number one spot on the weekly charts based on Variety's reports of box office revenue in 1971 and 1972, possibly held back by the exclusivity of its early roadshow run. The release peaked at number two in its second week of release, beat by the wider release of The French Connection. However, its long-term success shows that the film had legs, staying power. It had a lasting appeal that kept it running in theaters for an extended period, even if it didn't reach the heights of The Sound of Music's massive four-and-a-half-year run. Fiddler on the Roof, despite its classic sensibilities, had a seat at the table amongst this new, current film landscape. Speaking of, let's look at that landscape. The rapid influx of adult themes and content in American filmmaking had a ton of build-up and precedence, far preceding the release of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. First, we have the court case of the U.S. versus Paramount in 1948. This court case deemed it illegal for studios to own their own movie theaters, a practice that had been extremely common up to that point, and a practice that has more or less returned with studios owning their own streaming services. It also outlawed block booking, a practice in which a major studio would make an independent theater book several small-scale movies in order to get a big-ticket item. This, as well as the looming threat of television, lost studios tons of money that had been consistently coming in. Major studios started trying everything in order to keep audiences coming to the theater. Widescreen, Cinemascope, 3D, Cinerama, 70mm, Roadshow presentations, you name it. Through all of this, the Production Code, a set of rules strictly enforced in Hollywood starting around 1934 which forbade anything censors deemed as inappropriate, stayed firmly intact. Meanwhile, with studios not being able to own their own theaters and with block booking now out of play, foreign and independent cinema was now able to creep in here and there at American movie theaters. 
The US versus Paramount case coincided with the later part of the Italian neorealist movement, as directors strove to produce films that captured the nuance and everyday tragedy of the average person, especially in the aftermath of World War II. Furthermore, with many Americans moving to the suburbs post-World War II and with the auto industry booming, the drive-in theater began to increase in popularity, and with it, an influx of independent companies and features. In 1953, United Artists was actually not granted a seal of approval by the production office for their film, The Moon is Blue, citing that the quote-unquote light and gay treatment of the subject of illicit sex and seduction was inappropriate for mainstream audiences. United Artists decided to release the film without any additional cuts, which ended up driving a good portion of the film's marketing, that it was for adults only. Despite the film's middling reviews, this tactic seemed to work as it drove curiosity as to what salacious material could possibly be present and ended up making a profit. From here, filmmakers started to slowly but surely push the limits of what could be present in a film's content in spite of the production code. Arguably the biggest push towards more adult themes and content in American cinema was the absolute juggernaut of the French New Wave, starting in the mid to late 50s. Fed up with the lack of experimentation in French cinema, a group of young critics and filmmakers in Paris started trying new things with editing, virite, aka filming among real-life people and situations, stories, themes, and sexuality. The movement was focused in the idea of directors having authorial intent over producers and studios, leaning into auteur theory. The movement drew from Italian neorealism, but it maintained some of the glamour and style of classic Hollywood cinema pushing directors like Agnès Sparta, François Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, Jacques Demy, and many others into the filmmaking conversation. Most scholars cite Bonnie and Clyde as the true landmark of the start of the new Hollywood movement. Yes, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf had a fresh new director in Mike Nichols and its fair share of coarse language and existential dread, but it also starred two of the biggest actors in the world. It was based on an already popular play, and play adaptations on film were no new thing, in the decade leading up to Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf alone, audiences would have seen the various works of Tennessee Williams, as well as films like A Raisin in the Sun and The Children's Hour. Bonnie and Clyde, on the other hand, was fresh. Most of its cast had names a general audience didn't know yet. Faye Dunaway, Estelle Parsons, Jeed Wilder. If you'd been paying close attention, you might recognize Warren Beatty's name, but that's really it. Where Woolf's George and Martha were tragic in their dread, Bonnie and Clyde were painted as tragic in their anti-heroism. Suddenly, the screen had two anti-establishment figures disillusioned with the economic state who were betrayed in a bloodbath with such magnitude that had never before been witnessed on the big screen. And they were hot. The raw sexual chemistry of the two lead characters enticed audiences, and it pushed filmmakers to be more frank with their depictions of sexuality. By drawing from gangster films of yesteryear, the French New Wave, the rising counterculture, and the door cracked open by Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Bonnie and Clyde burst through and changed how producers, directors, and audiences approached Hollywood filmmaking. Beyond the box office success, though, it's notable to point out how profitable these films were. Bonnie and Clyde alone cost only $2.5 million to make, and it made $22 million. The number one movie of 1967, The Graduate, another early hallmark of the new Hollywood, cost $3 million and made $43.1 million. Compare this to the exorbitant costs of post Sound of Music movie musicals in their box office returns. Camelot cost around $13 million and returned just over $12 million. Dr. Doolittle was a massive failure in 1967, costing $17 million for production alone and returning $9 million. Even with the successes of 1968's Funny Girl and Oliver, the budgets of those films kept them from being as profitable as films like Bullet and Rosemary's Baby in the same year. The final nail in the big budget musical coffin was the poor box office performance of Hello Dolly in 1969, which made roughly $15 million against a $25 million budget. Meanwhile, 1969 saw major success in profitability for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Midnight Cowboy, and especially Easy Rider, which made $16.9 million on a $400,000 budget. In 1968, MPAA President Jack Valenti implemented the rating system, classifying a film's appropriate audience based on its content, G, PG, R, and X. This was the final nail in the coffin for the production code, allowing for the wide distribution and accessibility of films with adult themes. Old Hollywood, along with much of its exuberance, glamour, and gilded escapism, was dead.
1972, about four months after the release of Fiddler on the Roof, director Bob Fosse released his adaptation of the 1966 stage musical, Cabaret. The film touched on a myriad of themes and topics including the rise of fascism, bisexuality, abortion, anti-Semitism, and polyamory. The film dripped with cynicism and creepiness that had never been seen up to that point in a movie musical. It was dark and haunting. It was shocking. As Liza Minnelli's Sally Bowles carried herself with the confidence and poise of an old Hollywood starlet, the audience watched that persona unravel to reveal complexities and fears and danger, tapping into the psychology of a deeply troubled woman who was hiding behind a veneer of charm and romance. Fosse's staging and presentation of the film's musical numbers repelled escapism. Cabaret brilliantly showcased the inherent artifice of the movie musical, and new Hollywood audiences embraced it wholeheartedly. It's interesting to look at both Fiddler and Cabaret so closely. Fiddler is, undoubtedly, made in the grand tradition of the classic Hollywood musical. However, the way Jewison utilizes Fiddler's musical numbers, especially the ensemble numbers, isn't entirely far off from how Fosse would end up approaching the numbers in Cabaret. Though, admittedly, Jewison approaches with less of a dark edge. While Fiddler doesn't have the framing device of the Kit Kat Club to diegetically place all of its musical numbers, Jewison finds his own ways to make the musical nature of Fiddler stand on its own. First, let's talk about the casting. For almost everybody in the cast of Fiddler, the film would become the credit for which they were most known. For many, it was their only mainstream film credit. One of the defining aspects of the new Hollywood was how it ushered in a wide variety of new actors. I mentioned the cast of Bonnie and Clyde, but huge box office draws like Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Diane Keaton, Robert Redford, Jack Nicholson, and many others started to firmly establish their careers through the films of the new Hollywood. Fresh faces for fresh movies. Norman Jewison, in turn, avoided casting well-known actors in the roles, seeking authenticity for the film, its characters, and its mode of storytelling, seemingly noticing the mistakes that some of the musical flops of the 60s had made. Secondly, while Fiddler draws on many grand traditions of the American musical, various aspects push against and challenge what had been presented up to that point. Speaking of the 1964 Broadway opening, actor Stephen Mohannon said, quote, The curtain came up on Fiddler, but it came down on the Rodgers and Hammerstein style classic musical, unquote. Bach and Harnick fill the score with songs that can function as the standard hummable tune that were commonplace for musicals at the time, but said songs are informed by the distinct style and arrangements of Eastern European music. By mixing both musical traditions, they created something that felt, at the time, unique and fresh. Furthermore, the film opens in a perfectly tongue-in-cheek way, as Tevye directly addresses the audience while remarking, A fiddler on the roof. Sounds crazy, no? This in turn sets up that if the audience can believe in a fiddler playing on a roof, they can believe in a group of turn-of-the-century peasant villagers singing for the next three hours. This also foreshadows Tevye's conversations with God throughout the film, a method of storytelling and character work that probably wouldn't work as well if the film didn't immediately establish the breaking of the fourth wall in the first moments. Also in the film, pay attention to the ensemble numbers. The only people who visibly sing in the movie are specific characters with specific vocal lines. When an ensemble is heard singing, said ensemble is not seen singing, save for Lachaim, which I think ends up working as an ensemble number because it's a drinking song. And a group singing while in a drunken stupor, I believe, makes sense in terms of suspension of disbelief. Even Sunrise Sunset, primarily sung by Tevya and Golda, is presented as a soliloquy rather than a diegetic number. Jewison finds ways to balance the realism of Fiddler and the believability of its musical numbers. Furthermore, while many of the musicals of Rodgers and Hammerstein touched on social and historical issues, one could argue that they almost never fully grasped the full weight of them. One of the most prominent songs in Fiddler, Matchmaker Matchmaker, probably would have played incredibly well to women at the time, as the release of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique sparked second wave feminism in the United States. As I watched the scene in the film, I was reminded of the June Bride scene from Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, in which the seven women singing start to, uh, fall in love with their kidnappers. The ending of Matchmaker specifically feels like a subtle subversion of the way many women had been treated in big movie musicals up to that point. The song rejects the idea that these women are prizes to be won by the men of the story, especially without their consent. The plot lines around Zeitel, Hadel, and Hava give them the agency to push against their predetermined destinies and the cultural systems in place in a way that felt incredibly timely, 
and still reads to many as timely. In addition, the first act of the film adaptation of Fiddler ends with a pogrom, an anti-Semitic riot that was commonplace in Imperial Russia. This imagery in the film would have felt unfortunately prescient to audiences less than 30 years removed from Nazi Germany. Act 2 includes a wide variety of tragic moments, including Tevye disowning one of his daughters because she decides to marry outside of their religion, and the entire village of Anatevka being displaced from their longtime home. Fiddler was not the first musical to have a downbeat ending, but it was rare for a musical to be so candid and political in its portrayal of tragedy. Finally, Fiddler's color palette is decidedly muted. This contrasts greatly with the vibrant color palettes of classic MGM musicals and the roadshow films of the 50s and 60s. Even West Side Story, the most prominent musical tragedy up to this point, is soaked in vibrant reds and utilizes abstract dreamlike imagery. Fiddler, on the other hand, utilizes a lot of brown and green. These earth tones help to ground the village of Anatevka in reality, indicating that the story, despite its musical nature, is rooted in its very specific version of history and culture. These characters become real people with a specific way of life that's in danger of being threatened. If we look at three major sequential movie musical releases, we can see this transition play out in real time. The first, Hello Dolly, released in 1969, uses the high glamour and opulence indicative of old Hollywood aesthetics, dripping in jewels and, at that point, out of touch nostalgia. The third, Cabaret, released in 1972, is grimy and creepy, utilizing the smoky haze of the Kit Kat Club and the backdrop of the Nazi invasion to paint an undoubtedly dark picture. Between the two, Fiddler utilizes its natural aesthetics, snow, villages, grass, and dirt, as well as its unique music and story to almost reset the movie musical entirely. Fiddler acknowledges the past and the future, more or less saying, it's time for some new traditions, creating the path for Cabaret and films like it to succeed after Fiddler's release. Norman Jewison, who directed both musical television and filmmaking that was in tune with the zeitgeist, created a film that was so in tune with the steps a musical would need to take in order to play well in the new Hollywood. He embraced the classic traditions of the movie musical and moved it into the new era of filmmaking, utilizing real settings, little-known actors, and the grand scope of the stage musical's content and runtime. He embraced the highs and lows of the music, the arcs of the characters, and the movie musical form itself. Fiddler on the Roof is both old and new, classic and contemporary. It has show-stopping songs that stick around in the audience's heads, and it utilizes them in ways that maintain a level of diegetic realism. It was, I'd argue, the necessary step to firmly move the movie musical into the new filmmaking landscape. About three years after the release of Fiddler on the Roof, MGM released a compilation film entitled That's Entertainment to celebrate the studio's 50th anniversary. Throughout the film, various stars of classic movie musicals showcase clips from the various successes of MGM's creative output during its heyday. As the stars introduce various segments, they walk around the famed MGM lot, which looks almost unrecognizable in its state of disarray. The film, in essence, becomes a melancholic recognition of how much the classic movie musical had become a relic, visible through the ruins of the once glamorous, gilded studio. MGM's Xanadu had met its rosebud. I don't know if Norman Jewison knew he was making the last great musical road show. I have to assume he probably knew that the classic musical was on the way out given all of the decisions he made to ensure that Fiddler didn't fall into some of the overly sincere, artificial trappings of the MGM-style musical. The film he made though, intentionally or not, smartly reckons with the fate of the lavish movie musical, celebrates a lot of what made it so endearing through the bulk of classic Hollywood, and recognizes that it may be time to move forward. Fiddler on the Roof remains one of the most popular movie musicals ever released. In the 2022 documentary Fiddler's Journey to the Big Screen, Kayim Topol claims that upwards of a billion people have seen Fiddler around the world. If you go into any used video or DVD store, you'll probably find a handful of copies of the film on the shelves. If you live in any community with some level of local theater, there's probably been a live production of Fiddler around you at some point. Fiddler's songs have also been covered and sampled by a wide range of artists from The Temptations to rapper Flo Millie. The film adaptation of Fiddler on the Roof turned 50 last year, and what was astounding to me while re-watching the film for this essay was that many of Fiddler's themes, religious tradition, family, agency of self, and forced displacement, still echo extremely true decades later. Furthermore, the film carries each theme with a level of subtle candor that feels almost foreign to movie musicals even now. 
It was able to stand against its new Hollywood contemporaries because it wasn't afraid to be both a celebration and a reckoning. Jewison led his actors and their characters to be human, complex and funny and with desires and needs and shortcomings indicative of the distinct time and place in which it was being made. The tragedies of the second act are clearly foreshadowed in the first act, but it walks its lines so cleanly that it's able to balance tones of both joy and sorrow. The use of actual locations keeps the film grounded in its themes, with the songs feeling like an additional aspect of the world, natural to the uniquely chaotic tradition of the characters' lives. Fiddler on the Roof is a fitting end to the reign of the classic Hollywood musical, one whose place in history often gets overshadowed by the number of failures that preceded it in the years before its release. It's a film that's unafraid to indulge in the excess that defined movie musicals of the 50s and 60s. It screams Lachaim while walking towards a new life in the final reel. It dances and sings and mourns. It sings tradition while inviting new ideas as to what the movie musical could be. It allows the movie musical to be both old and new. Where many of the movie musicals of the mid to late 60s failed in a cynical attempt to recreate a lost magic, Fiddler found its power in its humanity and self-awareness. Fiddler on the Roof is a film that's unafraid to look to the future, seemingly aware that this might be the last hurrah. The movie musical in the new Hollywood may have seemed crazy, and pulling it off wasn't easy, but Fiddler on the Roof proved that there would always be ways for the movie musical to keep its balance. <laughs>